Hello, folks. Welcome to In Conversation With. This is the Center for the Arts weekly show in which we talk to local Nevada County residents about uh, experts about such topics as nature, lifestyle, food, and art. Today, we are going to be talking with David Wong about uh, photograph photographing art. <laughs> uh, members today are tuning in for free. Visit the center for the arts.org to learn more about the benefits of being a member. Um, we are changing our format today. We are switching to pre recorded um, for various reasons. But uh, as usual, these will be available for members on the website and uh, maybe for everybody a little later down the uh, road. Let me tell you what's going on at the Center for the Arts. We have a new all ages drawing class starting on Friday, the 23rd. Learn the basics of drawing from what kind of materials you can use to incorporating line, volume, and light. This six week course will provide you with all the tools necessary to begin drawing, however, and when it, whatever you desire, taught by local artist Linda Neely. This all age class meets on Fridays at 5.15. And um, I'm not sure if that's virtual or if that's actually in person. But uh, you can probably find out more at the center for the arts.org. Um, our next live stream streaming concert is also Friday the 23rd, featuring Elevation, a high energy funk rock band from Northern California. They are a jam band and a dance band with an emphasis on heavy bass lines and funky grooves. The smooth vocals of frontman Jay Silk and singer Bryn Farwell give Elevation a fresh sound that's both old school and modern. This event is also free to members. Tickets are on sale now at the center for the arts.org. All right, David, welcome. Hey, thank you very much, Jake. Okay, thank you for being here. Um, I know you're an accomplished uh, photographer. Um, you've also had, sorry, you've also had a, a career in videography. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your uh, personal history and your career before we uh, get into today's presentation? All right. Um, well, I, I've done a bunch of things. I've had like four different careers, but I'll go back as far as uh, I was in my previous to my photography full time. I was a I had a video production business in Silicon Valley. I did a lot of high tech companies, Intel. Sun Microsystems, Stanford University, places like that, and had fun traveling around the world doing videos of uh, people from, oh, Belgium to, uh, uh, you know, England, all over the place. Um, so that was a fun career and stopped doing that full time uh, just before I moved up here to Grass Valley and, and I resumed doing photography and have become have started uh, started when I came up here doing that full time, even though I was a, a photographer since I was about fifteen. Um, but the 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 digital dark room and all the digital photography suits me well. I I I like doing it on computers. So I teach. I do workshops around the world when we could travel, <laughs> and uh, I do. Uh, shows i'm a curator at a viewpoint photographic arts center in sacramento i am a member and participate in the local camera club with, with about 120 some odd members and yeah do a lot of that and exhibit here and there and uh you were associated with the artworks gallery in the Nevada city for a while yeah uh artworks uh, uh gallery uh, on mill street in grass valley um, so I was there uh, for uh, 10 years, just uh, started there just a month, a uh, couple of months after they opened. So I was almost a founding member and just decided to change directions and, and uh, looking to new ventures. Cool. And you've also raced cars, although we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> no, we could talk a lot about that, but I've also raced cars. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, I thought we, uh, the, the subject is how to photograph art. And as I started to think about it, 
uh, an awful lot of people do this type of stuff on their uh, camera phones. And I was going to talk more about uh, dedicated cameras, but I'm going to talk a lot about doing it with your, your Samsung or your iPhone or whatever, since that's what a lot of people do. Um, I, I can't cover everything. I, I, I spent quite a few hours putting this together. There's, you know, we could talk for a, a whole day on this subject and, and not cover everything. So uh, I'll kind of high spot everything and um, hopefully uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I won't make any mistakes. <laughs> yeah, I won't have any audience here since we're recorded to, to say, hey, that's not right. <laughs> anyway. Mistakes are welcome here. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's uh, let's get into it. All right. All right. So I, I put together a whole bunch of slides. Um, and I'm going to start with kind of the basics and we'll end up with um, the some of the hardest things to do at the end. So bear with me. And uh, I guess I'll go ahead and start with uh, sharing the screen. Huh? So um, how to photograph art. Uh, just uh, I'll, I'll preface it by saying it's a lot of fun. It's also one of the most challenging things you can do. So for all those artists out there that have done this and go, oh, this is really hard. It, it can be. It can be. Um, and, and I guess the, I always start with intent. You know, what do you want to use the photographs for? Um, the, um, there, I, I listed three things. Uh, informal purpose, like you just want to send photos to your friends and family, recording your art, or do you really want to, you know, print from it and things like that which require another degree of, of seriousness. So uh, if you're just doing informal art, uh, photos, you can use any of these devices, your, your dedicated camera, your cell phone, or uh, you can even use a webcam, although it's a little hard to position your, your, your photos all the time for using a webcam. Um, but any of these devices will work these days. Um, uh, you can use your, your camera phone, uh, which many people do, uh, and you can take great photos of it, as long as the lighting is good. Uh, if you're not fussy about uh, using for printing or whatnot, that's just fine. But the biggest thing is, uh, as you can see what I've written here, you, you have to have your, you want to start with your lighting and it's make sure that the lighting is, is even and you don't have bright and shadow areas. Uh, oftentimes, the, the, one of the easiest things to do is to use daylight to, to light your work. Um, just as long as you're not putting, hanging your, art or whatever you're photographing uh, in bright, direct sunlight. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, lighting your uh, points, here's a couple of points. Uh, Non-direct daylight is, is a good thing to use. It's easy, it, you, you don't have to set up anything. Uh, window light is a great source because window light is tends to be very soft and even. Uh, if you want to position your art, you know, with window light on it, that can be a, a useful uh, light source. Um, and using a diffuser, if you're using, uh, whether it's window light, window light is actually kind of diffused somewhat already. But if you use like a lamp or something, a diff diffuser helps to eliminate harsh lighting. And we'll talk more about diffusers towards the end of it. You don't, don't need to worry too much about what that is. Uh, here are some photos. Uh, and you can see, uh, we'll, we'll start with the, 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 the working horse, the Belgian horse over here on the left was taken outdoors uh, under uh, somewhat cloudy or skies. There's there's sun. There is daylight. Here's an example of a daylight shot. 
as well as the, the three uh, Shelties. These are daylight shots, but not under direct harsh sunlight. If we had direct harsh sunlight on this, just imagine you were trying to take a, a photo of some art. You know, you, you could get nice, even lighting. There is no hot spots. The colors look good. But look at the, the photo of the woman on the bottom right. This is not outdoors, but this is taken with direct flash, you know, right on the camera, right on her. Uh, if you were to take your photos outdoors uh, in direct sunlight, you would get something like this. She's, she's kind of washed out. There's not a lot of gradation in the tones. So if you're going to go outside, uh, you know, try to do it not uh, with the sun shining on your, on your photo. You know, go under an area, uh, maybe under a tree or under something else that's that uh, is shading the sun or uh, perfect conditions would be where there's sun is, uh, is there's some clouds. So uh, these are the types of things you can expect if you go outdoors. Here's, uh, here's a, a photo of uh, my dog, Zoe, who's no longer with us. This is window light. This is a window in back of Zoe. Now you may not want to, photograph your, uh, uh, your art with backlighting like this, but this just shows you, you know, the soft kind of diffuse light that you would get. The apples and the, and the lemons, uh, Mele e Lamone, uh, was done in, uh, I went all the way to Italy, the guy shot of apples and lemons. And, you know, this is window light, uh, again, with a, a, this, this wonderful texture of this windowsill in Italy. Uh, now, the bottom right is a photo from my property, bright daylight, you know, not a lot of soft definition. So this is what happens when you shoot with uh, bright daylight. Um, so one of the things, and we'll get a little bit techy here, uh, we'll talk about color balance. Um, it's something that people don't think about, but Light is not light. It, it, it has different temperatures. If you're shooting outdoors in uh, re regular sunlight, you're shooting at what they call uh, 5,800 degrees Kelvin. That's a wider light. If you come indoors, if you come indoors and you shoot under regular bulbs, that's a much warmer or, or reddish light. That's 3,200 degrees Kelvin. Uh, if you're outside and you're shooting with an overcast sky, that's actually a higher temperature, 6,500 to 8,000 degrees Kelvin blue tint. And you can see in the bottom, heavily overcast, 9,000 to 10,000, very blue tint. Now, why does this make a difference? Because you want your photos to look like the right color. And the, one of the hardest things about photographing art is the artist, if it's your own work, you know what that looks like. And if it photographs, you go, well, that red doesn't look like that, or that, that green doesn't look like that. And, all, and a lot of, all of this is influenced by getting the right color temperature. So you should be aware of this and you can set your cameras and you can uh, to have the right uh, color temperature. Uh, if it's a dedicated camera, you can, you can set that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But if you're using a smartphone, smartphones have what uh, it's called auto white balance. They'll balance for whatever they think the correct white is. But you can also change that. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But this is something you need to, to think about. In this photo here, um, Looking at, I went outdoors and the, the two photos on the right are uh, a, a, a matted photo that uh, I placed on just a white board. I just went outside, I stuck it on the ground and I took my, uh, my iPhone and I took these, this shot. Now you'll notice that in the top shot, the, that photo is on a on a uh, um, hardboard 
uh, mounted on a hardboard. I just placed that on top of a white foam core uh, for a background. And you'll notice that that's white. It looks, it looks pretty accurate. If you look at the bottom photo, it looks blue. And you'll notice the, the white actually looks blue. This is because I went outdoors and it was uh, very late in the day in the shade. Now, if you recall, I talked about color balance and because it was in the shade, it has this blue tint to it. Well, if you're photographing outdoors, you wanna be aware of the, the time of day, whether it's overcast or you're shooting behind the shade of a building or something. And, but these are things that, you know, the, the bottom photo is what I took. The top photo I corrected. And you can correct this. We'll talk a little bit about this in a little bit. You can correct this in um, things like Photoshop or Lightroom. Or if you're using a uh, smartphone, you can correct it in, uh, in applications like uh, Snapseed. Snapseed is a really popular uh, free application that you can get to work with your uh, smartphones. And finally on the left, here's a photo that was taken uh, with reflected against, uh, with actually a flash, it was bounced off the walls, but the flash had a, had a, uh, a filter in front of it that was warmer to uh, give you the sense of like incandescent light, you can see how much warmer that is. So you can, you know, you can either, uh, if you can either correct for a white point, you can make a photo warmer if you want. And well, that's all because of uh, color, white balance or color balance. Um, as I mentioned, um, and, and stop me if you have any questions along the way. I, I'm well, just... I, yeah, actually, you know, um, so I mean, considering that the software can do so much post uh, production, so to speak, you know, after you've shot it, but you think it's always better to try to get the lighting right and the white balance right before you take the photo. Yeah, it's, it's always better to try to do that. Uh, and you can do it post production. But, you know, if you have to go to, if you're using a regular a dedicated camera and you have to go to something like Lightroom or Photoshop or some other program, you know, it's, it's not hard to do, but uh, you, you'll, you'll uh, look for a white source on your photo. And I'll show you later on uh, about how to, how to do that. And you can correct for it, but sometimes you make a correction and you go, oh, the white looks right, but oh, the red over here doesn't look right. You know, maybe you had mixed color uh, sources. You know, try not to mix your color sources. If you shoot like indoors with something and you have, you know, uh, incandescent lighting indoors, and then you have window lighting coming in, and if it's a room, you've got mixed light sources. And if with mixed light sources, you, you may get some unintended uh, consequences. It's always better to try to, to correct the white balance before you shoot, and then you have less uh, to deal with in the post-production part of it, if plus, that makes sense. Plus, I guess there's always the issue of, well, how was your monitor calibrated? And maybe your monitor shifted. Oh, to the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I didn't talk about that on the slides, but monitor. everybody's looking at things on their computer monitor. My computer monitors, I use a calibration tool so that what I see is pretty close to what, you know, I, I shot, you know, but if you don't have a calibrated monitor and when you buy your monitors, your computers, none of them are, they're all factory calibrated, but that doesn't mean that the color you see, if you want to send a photo to say your client and you, you take a picture and, your, and you do all of this work, your client's computer monitor may show it differently. So there's a, that we, we wanna try to get as much of this correct with the, with the color balance or the white balance as possible. Yeah. 
All right. Um, yeah, just interrupt me if you have some questions. Uh, so if you shoot indoors, uh, incandescent old fashioned bulbs, uh, you know, you, you don't want to mix the light as I was, was mentioning. Try to do one light source. Uh, if you're going to shoot indoors, try to black out or put some covering over the window so you're not mixing it, you know, and you'll, you'll get a, a cleaner, cleaner photo. Um, if you're using a, a dedicated camera, uh, it's, it's better uh, than a smartphone, but smartphones are getting very good these days. Uh, you can change the dedicated camera to a different white balance, such as indoors, outdoors, shadow, fluorescent. You can even dial in a color temperature. Um, you can't do this with a smartphone, but it's not all lost because um, there are aftermarket applications that you can download to your smartphone, uh, like Snapseed or Camera Plus, that will allow you to adjust the white balance um, after, before, and after you've taken the shot. So, uh, you know, remember those uh, Snapseed is is really popular. It's free. Um, how is that? How is that spelled? Snap Seed. S N A P S E E D. Snap Seed. Okay. Yeah, and it's one of the most popular uh, applications for uh, smartphones. Whether yeah, it's uh, on iPhone. Yeah, doesn't make any difference. You know, either yeah, either one. Samsung, iPhone. It works on both both of those platforms. Uh, Camera Plus is another one. Camera Plus will cost you. Uh, 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 the princely sum of, I don't remember, three, four dollars or five dollars or something like that. So that's another application you can use for your uh, smartphone to make these, these adjustments. Um, so I talk about using a known light source. When I, uh, here's a, a photo that uh, with a chart in front of the painting, this was a painting. Uh, um, uh, that uh, my friend uh, Jude uh, had, had brought over to my place. But I use a color chart in this. Uh, a color chart is not expensive, but the color chart has, um, you can see different patches in here. And you can see in the bottom row, there's a, there's a set of patches from white to gray. And I can use these. I take a photo uh, of the art in the condition with the light conditions that I have. And then I put the first photo I take is with a, a color chart. So then I can say, well, what is, what is white? You know, I mean, they, the artist may not have uh, a white white or something in the photo or, or a reference. Uh, it could be, you can use white, you can use gray. I won't go into the technicalities, but you can use any of those to uh, uh, correct, you know, and you say, under this lighting condition, you know, maybe I'm using daylight um, types of lighting indoors, but they all vary a little bit, you know, a few hundred degrees different in color temperature, and it'll, it'll affect the, how the photo comes. So I, I use a color chart, or you can use a calibrated white or gray card to put in your shots so that you, uh, once you go into Snapseed or you go into Lightroom, you go, well, this, this is white. Here is the white square. And you can, they have in Lightroom and Photoshop, they have a little eyedropper that you can click on that white and you go, well, this is what white looks like in the photo with my light conditions. So these are, these are not expensive things. You can buy these things at a, uh, from uh, a, a camera store or some art supply places, but you can look online and look for uh, color, color charts. There's a number of different ways to do this. David, just one second. I have to take my bread out of the oven. Thirty seconds. Oh. <laughs> that that that's. Uh, I wish I could smell it. You know, uh, but that's one of the things. Use a known uh, color source. You know, just take the photo your first photo with it and then you can see uh, and this uh, this color chart 
you can see the various colors. Those are standard uh, colors that uh, every every uh, uh, photo studio uh, will be familiar with. So you can see is this is this yellow really look yellow is in my photo like like it does here and you'll and there without getting into the details there's there's even fancier ways of doing this automatically but that's a that's a whole nother couple hours worth of discussion so uh use a known light source in in your first shot and you'll have an idea a better idea of what it the white balance actually should be the digital dark room, scary thing. Um, there, uh, there is taking your photos with your camera, and what you get, uh, and there's what you there's what you use to adjust your photos after. Most of the photos you see in the world uh, these days in various media's uh, are pro are processed. Uh, with the digital darkroom, like Lightroom or Photoshop. Um, then, as I mentioned, the white balance uh, can be changed after the photo is taken, as Jake asked about. Uh, so it, it sounds scary, but it isn't. Uh, and you, if you're, if you're going to do a lot of photos, I would encourage you to you know, download something like Snapseed or uh, Lightroom and Photoshop. You can get those for a $10 subscription a month. There's even, I think, a free version of Lightroom that you can get that is Lightroom Light. Um, you might look at those. Um, here is that photo again that I took. You can see it's just on my driveway. I just held my iPhone over the, over the uh, photo. But if you look on the right side, you see that I have circled uh, kind of uh, with red. That's where in, uh, in uh, Lightroom and Photoshop, there's a little eyedropper there. So I can take that eyedropper, I can click on, in this case, the, the white foam board that I have behind this photo. If I clicked on that, it will, it, this is what will take it from that bluish tint, if you recall, that was in the original photo to white, because this is, this is white, this is my reference. Uh, I don't have a color chart here, but I used the white of the foam core board behind this to make the color correction. Uh, the smartphone apps can't do all of the adjustments that the, the like Lightroom or Photoshop have, but you can do a lot of the basic things. So uh, in fact, I would think for most of what you do with your smartphone, that may be all you need. Um, Other things to focus on, pun intended. Um, one of the things that people overlook is focusing. Uh, all cameras, smartphones, dedicated cameras have an autofocus function. If you leave your uh, DSLR or mirrorless dedicated camera on completely automatic mode, you're just saying, all right, camera, focus on whatever you think it should be focused on. Um, and this is even more so with a, with a smartphone. If you just take your smartphone, hold it up to something and click on it, uh, it may be in focus, it may not be in focus. If you're photographing 3D art and there's dimension to it, how do you, how does the, camera or the smartphone know what you want in focus. Uh, autofocus is great, but it doesn't always work for doing things like, like art. If you're shooting flat art, if you're shooting a painting, there's not a lot of uh, dimension to it. Uh, that may be okay with autofocus. Maybe the smartphone uh, or the camera will focus correctly. But if you're doing a sculpture or a piece of jewelry, um, your shots may be not focused where you think they should be focused. Um, and I've made that mistake and returned the, the art to the client. And, oh, I looked at it afterwards. Oh, my God, 
I didn't focus it on the right spot. That's pretty embarrassing for me, but uh, you, you need to pay attention to this. Um, in a smartphone, you can uh, manually focus it. And there is a couple of different ways to focus it. If you look at this flower, you'll see that there's the little square in the upper right side. So all your uh, smartphones, if you just tap on the spot that you want to be in focus, it will focus to that spot just by tapping on it. It's just like you know manually focusing. And if for many of them, if you tap and hold, it'll actually lock on that spot. So as long as uh, you don't change the distance from your camera to the subject or to the piece of art that you're photographing, uh, that, that focus will stay. But if as soon as you move closer or farther away, uh, you'll have to redo that. Um, also, uh, for uh, all your phones, you can, uh, on the iPhones, I, I don't know how it works on the Samsung. I'm, I'm supposing it's pretty much the same. And maybe you, I don't know if any of you use them. You could tell me that the exposure after you set the focus, you can swipe up and down on the screen to change your exposure and make it brighter or darker. Um, so there's, even though the, the smartphone doesn't have these knobs and buttons and whatever, everything is done with a tap or a swipe. So make sure that if you're taking a photo with your smartphone, that you you focus, get the focus on the intended point. Um, it's always best to review. You don't just take the shot and, and assume that it's in focus just by looking at your smartphone. You know, zoom, zoom into it. You can zoom into it with, you know, with the pinch on the screen and expanding the two fingers on the screen and it'll zoom, it'll zoom in and you'll see, oh, you know, it really is or really is not in focus. Don't assume from the big picture that it's in, in that's a really big mistake. Most people don't pay attention to this, but you need to. Um, on a dedicated camera, you, uh, you can um, hit the button to zoom into it. If you take, if you take a lot of photos, you might even want to do manual focus, and manual focus instead of autofocus. Uh, many of the cameras have an automatic zoom in function with uh, with uh, manual focus. So you'll you'll turn your focusing ring, and it actually zooms into the shot so that you can see it, you know, up uh, closer. Uh, to see if it's really in focus. Uh, that's really important, especially if you're doing 3D art. Um, then finally, understand the various focus modes. If you're, you know, as we get older, you know, my vision gets a little, <laughs> it's not as good as it used to be. Uh, you might want to use autofocus, but understand the different autofocus modes. Um, cameras, dedicated cameras have a, a wide autofocus, a zone, smaller spot areas. So understand how to set those. So, you know, if you're doing a lot of things like art, you might want to just, especially if you're doing 3D art, you might want to set it to a, a, a smaller spot focus. So if you're taking a, a photo of a piece of jewelry, you want to make sure that, that that front part of that jewelry is in focus and you want to check, you know, all around. So um, uh, we could spend a lot of time on this, but, you know, learn those settings. Those are pretty simple. Um, so here is an example. You know, here is a, a photo. I, I took this bottle of Lucchese wine all the way to Italy with me because they wanted a shot. You know, they wanted, I, took, I took this bottle to three or four different cities in Italy. You know, and here is the photo of the bottle of, at, the, at a beach in Italy. Uh, now, I wanted the bottle in focus. I did not want the beach. If I, I wanted it not to be distracting. Here's an example of understanding focus. In this photo on the upper right, uh, this is, uh, these are three little art pieces that 
Yvonne, a photographer, Yvonne Doctor, a local, uh, very good local uh, artist. And it's 3D uh, and it's critical that, that you get the focus right on the face, the front part of the, of the 3D image. And in the flower, you can see, I wanted the flower in focus. I did not want the background in focus. So uh, understanding where to focus, if you took a picture of this flower with a wide area of focus on your camera, it may focus on the back green leaf rather than the, the white petals, or it may focus on something in the background. You, you, you don't know if you just let the camera determine it for you. Other photo bummers. Um, Everybody loves using their smartphone because of their small size um, or the little mirrorless camera. Um, but even if you get a good focus, a lot of shots are ruined by camera motion. You know, you're not holding the camera properly. And I could show you, you know, I teach all my students, this is how you hold your, your dedicated camera. And you can get shots that are pack sharp, even with very slow shutter speeds uh, by how you hold it. So uh, this is something you, you want to pay attention to. Um, for a dedicated camera, you can change your shutter speeds to help stop the blur caused by uh, not holding your camera steady. Uh, and here's more kind of getting into the weed stuff. If you're shooting with a dedicated camera, and tell me if, if, if this is too technical, but I, I think it's important. Um, if you're shooting with a dedicated camera and you have a zoom lens, your, your zoom lens goes from wide to medium to telephoto, uh, depending on, on the range of the zoom lens. If you're, if you're shooting with a your lens set at uh, 100 millimeters, and you'll see it on the on the lens itself. You can turn it to 100, and that means it's 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 a moderate telephoto. If you set it at 100, how do you know what your shutter speed should be to avoid uh, the camera motion? Well, the rule of thumb is one over whatever the focal length is. So in this case, if its focal length is 100 you go one over 100 is the shutter speed you should use as a general rule of thumb to help you prevent uh, um, motion, motion uh, effects in your shot. If you're shooting with a wider angle uh, focal length, like 24 millimeters, which is fairly wide, then you can shoot one over uh, 125th, uh, since there's no setting on the camera for one over 124th. So that'll be a, a rule of thumb you can use if you're shooting with a dedicated camera. But you never have to worry about motion if you use a tripod. Now here is my, my iPhone on a simple holder that I just mount to a, to a tripod. Um, I always tell people you should buy a decent tripod. Costs, a good tripod costs less than a, good, a night of good dinner, uh, uh, dinner out. Uh, the $20 ones, yeah, I don't like them because you know, regardless, you, you think a tripod is a tripod, it's a tripod. That's not true. If you if you have one of these $20 wonders and you extend it up three, four, five feet, uh, just push on it. You'll be amazed how much it wobbles. Um, so spend a little bit more on a tripod and, uh, and you won't have to worry so much about it. Uh, here is the, a couple of shots. You, you see on the bottom right, here's the, the holder, and, and it just has a spring-loaded thing. So you, you just take your, your smartphone and you just pull up the holder and stick it in there. And now you have a, a stable platform. You could shoot at, you know, you can shoot for five seconds, 10 seconds. 
whatever you need to do. And, and uh, if you're under low light conditions, this is really good. Yeah, you don't have to worry about motion. Okay, more to focus on, another, uh, another pun. Uh, camera phones uh, have uh, what they call a fixed aperture. If you're shooting flat art, you don't have to worry so much about it. Like in this case, this is you know, flat art. But if you're shooting uh, in, you know, where you have more in back and front, then you need to think about what your aperture is. Uh, and and uh, because we got time limitations, apertures, big f-stop numbers like f16 are will get you more in focus or better depth of field, they call it, as in this shot here. Um, um, okay, so uh, how do you how do you get if you're using a, a dedicated camera, you can change that f-stop to get more or less in, in focus. Um, and if you are, let's see, let's skip over to this shot here. You can control your, your what's in focus in two ways. Even with a camera phone that has fixed f stops, you can move closer to a shot and less will be in focus in back and in front. If you move away from a shot, uh, more will be in focus in front or in back. So if you're doing a, a flower like this, you don't want the background to be in focus, move closer. Um, and uh, there's also a couple of other ways to, to control this. Uh, even for smartphones, a lot of them come with two or three lenses. Uh, if you use a wider, the wider angle lens, uh, more will be in focus in front and in back. It, and then in this case, where you're taking the photo of the room, I want more to be in focus. So I use a wider angle lens. I got more of the room, you know, more is in focus. Um, camera phones are getting more capable these days. Uh, and the iPhones, you can go into a portrait mode. And even though you can't change the aperture, you can simulate this. And uh, in portrait mode, there's a way to do this in software on the, on the phone. So uh, take a look at your Samsungs. I'm sure that they're, they have the same uh, capabilities. Uh, ISO, um, what's ISO? Well, ISO is, a, is another function that will allow you to take a photo in darker or light or brighter light. The higher the ISO number, the, the lower the light you can take it in, but there's no free lunch. And what you get with the high ISO, if you're taking a photo in darker light, you get more grain. Uh, oop, wrong way. Here's a shot I took with an old iPhone in front of the Metropolitan Museum in New York at nighttime. You can see how grainy it is because the camera automatically boosted up the ISO for the low level of light. Here's a shot I took outdoors on a hiking trail with very low ISO, you'll notice uh, you don't see that grain like you did in the other shot. So pay attention to that. Uh, you can change, your ISO is automatically adjusted for you on a smartphone. But if you use a, an application like uh, Camera Plus, you can actually manually change your ISO in your uh, smartphone. All right, here's the, for the, the best for last. Uh, one of the most challenging situations that artists get to uh, find is they want to photograph something behind glass. Oh, or you want to photograph it with a lot of surface detail. How do you do that? Here's a setup I have in my studio where I have two lights. They're spaced 45 degrees from the center line. Uh, to focus, uh, to minimize the reflections on this, on this piece of art here. It gives me a broad, even light. Um, and here, uh, another alternative is to go back outside, like we did with the other shot, where the, the, the light is coming from many different directions, and you don't have one uh, angle. If, I, if you took this shot here with the light directly from where I'm standing with the camera, you'll get a reflection right at you 
and you, you'll, you'll be cursing all the time. Uh, here's a diagram of that. It, uh, you can see where the camera is. I even use a black cloth around my camera so that I'm not reflected in the glass that I'm, I'm shooting. Um, I'm using a diffuser on my light. Uh, what is a diffuser? If you look at the light, there is, there's a little panel in front that makes the light uh, softer than it actually is. Uh, you can see in this picture, here's the LED light behind it. And this is just a little piece of, uh, of cloth in front. You can use, uh, uh, you can use things like a bed sheet in front of a, of a clamp on light or something like that. If, uh, for your, for your home usage, um, experiment with moving the lights closer or further away, the closer the light is to your subject, the softer the light looks, the further away, the harsher the light looks. I know that sounds, uh, counterintuitive, but, uh, it actually, you know, if you take a photograph of a person and you move the light closer to them, their face will look better. Another thing you can do is you can use what are called uh, V flats or something to reflect the light source. This makes the little lamp look much bigger and uh, this will help you reduce uh, reflections. And here's, a, here's how you might do that. You see the, the V flats are, uh, mounted at 45 degrees. There's a light I have on top that shines on the, on the flat, which is white, and it reflects onto the artwork. Uh, here's a, a diagram I borrowed from a teaching site. You wanna think about perspective too. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're horizontally and vertically aligned with the center of your art. If you don't do that, your, uh, your photo will, will look tilted or distorted. And yes, you can correct that in programs like Photoshop and Lightroom or even in Snapseed, but it's much better to start with your camera in the right position or your smartphone in the right position. Otherwise you'll spend a lot of time correcting for distortion that you don't have to do. Um, and finally, cropping and sizing your photo. Um, you wanna take your shot with the photo, with your subject or the art piece, filling as much of the frame as possible. If, you, uh, if you're going to blow this piece up and you wanna print it to a bigger size and the photo is too small, you've thrown away a lot of pixels and the photo won't look as good. So I would always encourage you to take the, uh, take the photo of the art, you know, pretty much filling the frame. You don't want to overfill it so that you make a mistake and, and, and catch an edge that you didn't intend to catch. Also, if it's a vertical piece, turn your camera. Don't take the, the image uh, with your camera horizontally. You can always turn your, your camera. And that way, if it's, if it's in portrait mode, turn your camera in portrait mode to take the shot. Um, that's it. That's fantastic. And uh, thank you, David. I, I really learned a lot. And, I, you know, photography is an art form. There's a lot more we could talk about. I know we haven't talked about color spaces or printing <laughs> or so many uh -huh. other things, but we have used up our time. So... All right. Well, thank you very much. I know there was kind of a lot in a very short period of time. And if you if you have any questions, then you can always you know direct a, an email to me at uh, at dw at uh, photography by david wong dot com. Um, and that that's your website. Photography that's my david. email. My website is uh, just you know, www www dot photography by david wong.com and you can contact me leave me a message through my website as well and you offer classes i know online classes yeah i do online classes i'll do i'll do uh, custom classes uh, I, I don't charge very much money uh, uh, i'll do singles uh, two three people four people 
uh, for a group class. Uh, if you want to go with me to Ireland or Costa Rica, you can come with me and we'll I'll teach you photography in, in groups there or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm easy. <laughs> that sounds fun. That sounds great. I'd love to do that. Uh, and you also have Facebook and Instagram. You're full yeah, Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram photos. Uh, David Wong photos on Instagram and and Facebook. You can you can find me on on you know most of the platforms. Okay. Well, thank you very much, David. And uh, thank you everybody who's watching this. Uh, now we're in the future. Next week uh, we will be talking to Shane Hanafi about uh, California native plants. That should be a very interesting discussion. And uh, remember, all these are available to watch at the Center for the Arts.org. My name is Jake Fredon Addy. Thank you for being here for In Conversation with. See you next week. All right. Bye. Bye.